Episode 8 of Space Prison by Tom Godwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Space Prison, Episode 8. It was winter of the year 85, and the temperature was 106 degrees below zero. Walter Humboldt stood in front of the ice tunnel that led back through the glacier to the caves and looked up into the sky. It was noon, but there was no sun in the starlit sky. Many weeks before, the sun had slipped below the southern horizon. For a little while, a dim halo had marked its passage each day. Then that, too, had faded away. But now it was time for the halo to appear again, to herald the sun's returning. Frost filled the sky, making the stars flicker as it swirled endlessly downward. He blinked against it, his eyelashes trying to freeze to his lower eyelids at the movement, and turned to look at the north. There the northern lights were a gigantic curtain that filled a third of the sky, rippling and waving in folds that pulsated in red and green, rose and lavender and violet. Their reflection gleamed on the glacier that sloped down from the caves and glowed softly on the other glacier the one that covered the transmitter station. The transmitter had long ago been taken into the caves, but the generator and water wheel were still there, frozen in a tomb of ice. For three years the glacier had been growing before the caves, and the plateau's southern face had been buried under snow for ten years. Only a few woods goats ever came as far north as the country south of the caves, and they stayed only during the brief period between the last snow of spring and the first snow of fall. Their winter home was somewhere down near the equator. What had been called the southern lowlands was a frozen, lifeless waste. Once they had thought about going to the valley in the chasm where the mockers would be hibernating in their warm caves, but even if they could have gone up the plateau and performed the incredible feat of crossing the glacier-covered, blizzard-ripped crags, they would have found no food in the Mockers' Valley, only a little corn the Mockers had stored away, which would soon have been exhausted. There was no place for them to live but in the caves or as nomads migrating with the animals and if they migrated to the equator each year, they would have to leave behind them all the books and tools and everything that might some day have given them a civilized way of life, and might some day have shown them how to escape from their prison. He looked again to the south, where the halo should be, thinking, they should have made their decision in there by now. I'm their leader, but I can't force them to stay here against their will. I could only ask them to consider what it would mean if we left here." Snow creaked underfoot as he moved restlessly. He saw something lying under the blanket of frost and went to it. It was an arrow that someone had dropped. He picked it up, carefully, because the intense cold had made the shaft as brittle as glass. It would regain its normal strength when taken into the caves. There was the sound of steps, and Fred Schroeder came out of the tunnel, dressed as he was dressed in bulky furs. Schroeder looked to the south and said, "'It seems to be starting to get a little lighter there.' He saw that it was, a small, faint paling of the black sky. "'They talked over what you and I told them,' Schroeder said, "'and about how we've struggled to stay here this long, and how—' even if the sun should stop drifting south this year, it will be years of ice and cold at the caves before big spring comes. "'If we leave here, the glacier will cover the caves and fill them with ice,' he said. "'All we ever had will be buried back in there, and all we'll have left will be our bows and arrows and animal skins. We'll be taking a one-way road back into the Stone Age.' for ourselves and our children and their children. "'They know that,' Schroeder said. "'We both told them.' He paused. They watched the sky to the south turn lighter. The northern lights flamed unnoticed behind them as the pale halo of the invisible sun slowly brightened to its maximum. 
Their faces were white, with near freezing. Then they turned to go back into the caves. They had made their decision, Schroeder went on. I guess you and I did them an injustice when we thought they had lost their determination, when we thought they might want to hand their children a flint axe and say, Here, take this, and let it be the symbol of all you are or all you will ever be. Their decision was unanimous. We'll stay for as long as it's possible for us to survive here. Howard Lake listened to teacher Morgan West read from the diary of Walter Humboldt, written during the terrible winter of thirty-five years before. Each morning the light to the south was brighter. On the seventh morning we saw the sun, and it was not due until the eighth morning. It will be years before we can stop fighting the enclosure of the glacier, but we have reached and passed the dead of big winter. We have reached the bottom, and the only direction we can go in the future is up. And so, West said, closing the book, we are here in the caves tonight because of the stubbornness of Humboldt and Schroeder and all the others. Had they thought only of their own welfare, had they conceded defeat and gone into the migratory way of life, we would be sitting beside grass campfires somewhere to the south tonight, our way of life containing no plans or aspirations greater than to follow the game back and forth through the years. Now let's go outside to finish tonight's lesson. Teacher West led the way into the starlit night just outside the caves, Howard Lake and the other children following him. West pointed to the sky, where the star group they called the Athena constellation blazed like a huge arrowhead high in the east. There, he said, beyond the top of the arrowhead is where we were going when the Gurn stopped us a hundred and twenty years ago and left us to die on Ragnarok. It's so far that Athena's sun can't be seen from here. So far that it will be another hundred and fifteen years before our first signal gets there. Why is it, then, that you and all the other groups of children have to learn such things as history, physics, the Gurn language, and the way to fire a Gurn blaster? The hand of every child went up. West selected eight-year-old Clifton Humboldt. Tell us, Clifton, he said. Because, Clifton answered, a Gurn cruiser might pass by a few light years out at any time and pick up our signals. So we have to know all we can about them and how to fight them because there aren't very many of us yet. The Gurns will come to kill us, little Marie Chiara said, her dark eyes large and earnest. They'll come to kill us and to make slaves out of the ones they don't kill, like they did with the others a long time ago. They're awful mean and awful smart and we have to be smarter than they are. Howard looked again at the Athena constellation, thinking, I hope they come just as soon as I'm old enough to fight them, or even tonight. Teacher, he asked, how would a Gurn cruiser look if it came tonight? Would it come from the Athena arrowhead? It probably would, West answered. You would see its rocket blast, like a bright trail of fire. A bright trail of fire burst suddenly into being, coming from the constellation of Athena and lighting up the woods and hills and their startled faces as it arced down toward them. "'It's them!' a treble voice exclaimed, and there was a quick flurry of movement as Howard and the other older children shoved the younger children behind them. Then the light vanished, leaving a dimmer glow where it had been. "'Only a meteor,' West said." He looked at the line of older children who were standing protectingly in front of the younger ones, rocks in their hands with which to ward off the gurns, and he smiled in the way he had when he was pleased with them. Howard watched the meteor trail fade swiftly into invisibility and felt his heart beat slow from the first wild thrill to gray disappointment. Only a meteor. But some day he might be leader and by then, surely, the Gurns would come. If not, he would find some way to make them come. Ten years later, Howard Lake was leader. 
There were three hundred and fifty of them then, and Big Spring was on its way to becoming Big Summer. The snow was gone from the southern end of the plateau, and once again game migrated up the valleys east of the caves. There were many things to be done now that Big Winter was past, and they could have the chance to do them. They needed a larger pottery kiln, a larger workshop and a wooden lathe, more diamonds to make cutting wheels, more quartz crystals to make binoculars and microscopes. They could again explore the field of inorganic chemistry, even though results in the past had produced nothing of value, and they could, within a few years, resume the metal prospecting up the plateau, the most important project of all. Their weapons seemed to be as perfect as was possible, but when the Gurns came, they would need some quick and certain means of communication between the various units that would fight the Gurns. A leader who could not communicate with his forces and coordinate their actions would be helpless. And they had on Ragnarok a form of communication, if trained, that the Gurns could not detect or interfere with electronically. The mockers. The crags were still white and impassable with snow that summer, but the snow was receding higher each year. Five years later, in the summer of 135, the crags were passable for a few weeks. Lake led a party of eight over them and down into the chasm. They took with them two small cages, constructed of wood and glass, and made airtight with the strong medusa-bush glue. Each cage was equipped with a simple air pump and a pressure gauge. They brought back two pairs of mockers, as interested and trusting captives, together with a supply of the orange corn and a large amount of diamonds. The mockers, in their pressure-maintained cages, were not even aware of the increase in elevation as they were carried over the high summit of the crags. To Lake and the men with him, the climb back up the long, steep slope of the mountain was a stiff climb to make in one day, but no more than that. It was hard to believe that it had taken Humboldt and Barber almost three days to climb it, and that Barber had died in the attempt. It reminded him of the old crossbows that Humboldt and the others had used. They were thin, with a light pull, such as the present generation boys used. It must have required courage for the old ones to dare unicorn attacks, with bows so thin that only the small area behind the unicorn's jaws was vulnerable to their arrows. When the caves were reached, a very gradual reduction of pressure in the mocker cages was started, one that would cover a period of weeks. One pair of mockers survived, and had two young ones that fall. The young mockers, like the first generation of Ragnarok-born children of many years before, were more adapted to their environment than their parents were. The orange corn was planted, using an adaptation method somewhat similar to that used with the mockers. It might have worked had the orange corn not required such a long period of time in which to reach maturity. When winter came, only a few grains had formed. They were saved for next year's seeds, to continue the slow adaptation process. By the fifth year, the youngest generation of mockers was well adapted to the elevation of the caves, but for a susceptibility to a quickly fatal form of pneumonia, which made it necessary to keep them from exposing themselves to the cold or to any sudden changes of temperature. Their intelligence was surprising, and they seemed to be partially receptive to human thoughts, as Bill Humboldt had written. By the end of the fifteenth year, their training had reached such a stage of perfection that a mocker would transmit or not transmit with only the unspoken thought of its master to tell it which it should be. In addition, they would transmit the message to whichever mocker their master's thought directed. Presumably, all mockers received the message, but only the mocker to whom it was addressed would repeat it aloud. They had their method of communication. They had their automatic crossbows for quick, close fighting, and their long-range longbows. They were fully adapted to the 1.5 gravity, and their reflexes were almost like those of prowlers. Ragnarok had long ago separated the quick from the dead. 
There were eight hundred and nineteen of them that year, in the early spring of one hundred and fifty, and they were ready and impatient for the coming of the Gurns. Then the transmitter, which had been in operation again for many years, failed one day. George Craig had finished checking it when Lake arrived. He looked up from his instruments, remarkably similar in appearance to a sketch of the old George Ord, a resemblance that had been passed down to him by his mother, and said, "'The entire circuit is either gone or ready to go. It's already operated for a lot longer than it should have.' "'It doesn't matter,' Lake said. "'It served its purpose. We won't rebuild it.' George watched him questioningly. "'It served its purpose.' he said again. It didn't let us forget that the Gurns will come again. But that isn't enough now. The first signal won't reach Athena until the year 235. It will be the dead of big winter again, then. They'll have to fight the Gurns with bows and arrows that the cold will make as brittle as glass. They won't have a chance. No, George said, they won't have a chance but what can we do to change it? It's something I've been thinking about, he said. We'll build a hyperspace transmitter and bring the Gurns before big winter comes. We will? George asked, lifting his dark eyebrows. And what do we use for the three hundred pounds of copper and five hundred pounds of iron we would have to have to make the generator? Surely we can find five hundred pounds of iron somewhere on Ragnarok. The north end of the plateau might be the best bet. As for the copper, I doubt that we'll ever find it. But there are seams of a bauxite-like clay in the western hills. They're certain to contain aluminum, to at least some extent, so we'll make the wires of aluminum. The ore would have to be refined to pure aluminum oxide before it could be smelted. George said. And you can't smelt aluminum ore in an ordinary furnace. Only in an electric furnace, with a generator that can supply a high amperage. And we would have to have cryolite ore to serve as the solvent in the smelting process. There's a seam of cryolite in the eastern hills, according to the old maps, said Lake. We can make a larger generator by melting down everything we have. It wouldn't be big enough to power the hyperspace transmitter, but it should be big enough to smelt aluminum ore. George considered the idea. I think we can do it. How long until we can send the signal? he asked. Given the extra metal we need, the building of the generator is a simple job. The transmitter is what will take years, maybe as long as fifty. Fifty years. Can't anything be done to make it sooner? he asked. I know, George said. You would like for the Gurns to come while you're still here. So would every man on Ragnarok. But even on Earth, the building of a hyperspace transmitter was a long, slow job, with all the materials they needed and all the special tools and equipment. Here, we'll have to do everything by hand. And for materials, we have only broken and burned out odds and ends. It will take about fifty years. It can't be helped. Fifty years. But that would bring the Gurns before Big Winter came again. And there was the rapidly increasing chance that a Gurn cruiser would at any day intercept the first signals. They were already more than halfway to Athena. Melt down the generator, he said. Start making a bigger one. Tomorrow men will go out after bauxite and cryolite, and four of us will go up the plateau to look for iron. Lake selected Gene Taylor, Tony Chiara, and Steve Schroeder to go with him. They were well on their way by daylight the next morning, on the shoulder of each of them a mocker which observed the activity and new scenes with bright, interested eyes. They traveled light, since they would have fresh meat all the way and carried herbs and corn only for the mockers. Once, generations before, it had been necessary for men to eat herbs to prevent deficiency diseases, but now the deficiency diseases, like hell fever, 
were unknown to them. They carried no compasses, since the radiations of the two suns constantly created magnetic storms that caused compass needles to swing as much as twenty degrees within an hour. Each of them carried a pair of powerful binoculars, however, binoculars that had been diamond-carved from the ivory-like black unicorn horn and set with lenses and prisms of diamond-cut quartz. The foremost bands of woods-goats followed the advance of spring up the plateau, and they followed the woods-goats. They could not go ahead of the goats. The goats were already pressing close behind the melting of the snow. No hills or ridges were seen as the weeks went by, and it seemed to Lake that they would walk forever across the endless rolling floor of the plain. Early summer came, and they walked across a land that was green and pleasantly cool at a time when the vegetation around the caves would be burned brown and lifeless. The woods goats grew less in number then, as some of them stopped for the rest of the summer in their chosen latitudes. They continued on, and at last they saw, far to the north, what seemed to be an almost infinitesimal bulge on the horizon. They reached it two days later a land of rolling green hills, scarred here and there with ragged outcroppings of rock, and a land that climbed slowly and steadily higher as it went into the north. They camped that night in a little vale. The floor of it was white with the bones of woods-goats that had tarried too long the fall before and got caught by an early blizzard. There was still flesh on the bones, and scavenger rodents scuttled among the carcasses, feasting. We'll split up now, he told the others the next morning. He assigned each of them his position. Steve Schroeder to parallel his course thirty miles to his right, Gene Taylor to go thirty miles to his left, and Tony Chiara to go thirty miles to the left of Taylor. We'll try to hold those distances, he said. We can't look over the country in detail that way, but it will give us a good general survey of it. We don't have too much time left by now, and we'll make as many miles into the north as we can each day. The woods goats will tell us when it's time for us to turn back. They parted company with casual farewells, but for Steve Schroeder, who smiled sardonically at the bones of the woods goats in the vale and asked, Who's supposed to tell the woods goats? Tip, the black, white-nosed mocker on Lake's shoulder, kept twisting his neck to watch the departure of the others, until he had crossed the next hill and the others were hidden from view. "'All right, Tip,' he said then. "'You can unwind your neck now.' "'Unwind. All right. All right,' Tip said. Then, with a sudden burst of energy which was characteristic of the mockers, he began to jiggle up and down and chant in time with his movements. "'All right. All right. All right. All right. Shut up,' he commanded. If you want to talk nonsense, I don't care, but don't say all right any more. All right, Tip agreed amiably, settling down. Shut up if you want to talk nonsense, I don't care. And don't slaughter the punctuation like that. You change the meaning entirely. But don't say all right any more, Tip went on, ignoring him. You change the meaning entirely. Then, with another surge of animation, Tip began to fish in his jacket pocket with little hand-like paws. Tip hungry! Tip hungry! Lake unbuttoned the pocket and gave Tip an herb leaf. I notice there is no nonsensical chatter when you want to ask for something to eat. Tip took the herb leaf, but he spoke again before he began to eat, slowly, as though trying to seriously express a thought. Tip hungry! No nonsensical! Sometimes he said, turning his head to look at Tip, you mockers give me the peculiar feeling that you're right on the edge of becoming a new and intelligent race, and no fooling. Tip wiggled his whiskers and bit into the herb leaf. No fooling, he agreed. He stopped for the night in a steep-walled hollow and built a small fire of dead moss and grass to ward off the chill that came with dark. He called the others, thinking first of Schroeder, so that Tip would transmit to Schroeder's mocker. Steve? Here, Tip answered, in a detectable imitation of Schroeder's voice. No luck. He thought of Gene Taylor and called, Gene? 
There was no answer, and he called Chiara. "'Tony, could you see any of Jean's route today?' "'Part of it,' Chiara answered. "'I saw a herd of unicorns over that way. Why, doesn't he answer?' "'No.' "'Then,' Chiara said, "'they must have got him.' "'Did you find anything today, Tony?' he asked. "'Nothing but pure andesite, not even an iron stain.' It was the same kind of barren formation that he, himself, had been walking over all day, but he had not expected success so soon. He tried once again to call Jean Taylor. "'Jean! Jean! Are you there, Jean?' There was no answer, and he knew there would never be. End of Episode 8 <laughs>